Good morning and welcome to our mid-season update 23-24 internal webinar um, presented by me, Matt Hadrill and Angie Fisher. Uh, this report is set to release next week and it will basically give an update of how the season has progressed from our other report that we put out in October called the New Season Outlook. Um, the highlights of this report, we're, Basically, I'll go over the highlights, give a little bit of a market update, go over the key annual prices um, based on the actuals that have flowed in for the season and how we think the rest of the season will roll out, including some export prices. Angie will give up a give an update for farm profitability and also some farmer facing tools for the extension team to have a look at. Um, for the rest of the season, demand is looking quite mixed to poor and prices generally will be softer. This is especially true for sheep meat um, and the price of um, sheep meat for both lamb and mutton is at multi-year lows. Additionally, as a consequence of that, farm profit, profit is forecast to decrease an estimated 54% to an average of 63% two thousand dollars per far per farm which is the lowest has been in multiple of years uh driving this is the current state of china and australia being our biggest competitor especially for sheep australia has proven to be quite competitive on the export markets at present um, with them downsizing their national flock and proving to be very competitive in supplying on world markets, especially into China. Also, additionally, China is very, very poor e economically at the moment, and consumer sentiment it seems to be uh, be really bad at present, especially compared to two years ago, and consumers over there are just not eating out as much as they used to. There's a little bit of a positive beef prices still seem to be holding driven by American demand even though they're slightly decreasing they're still staying two percent above the five-year average um, and we have a uh, excellent lamb crop in spring 2023 which will provide greater numbers of lambs to sell so that's the only few positives that we're able to realize in this mid-season update China is not looking good um, and it is one of the biggest reasons why we are having the biggest uh, decreases of price, decreases in pricing and how that flows all the way back to the farm gate. It is a multifaceted problems of all parts of the economy from government, government investment, um, private investment, foreign investment, uh, consumption, um, high youth unemployment, especially for um, fresh graduates at a university that can't seem to find jobs. It is a whole cacophony of not good vibes. It's the easiest way to put it. Um, and there is still this overarching thing of not releasing enough data, um, not releasing enough media to give investors hope. Um, so it's just not good. Um, alongside this, Australia has been incredibly competitive. Um, they have been i'll show some graphs soon but they have um processing a lot of animals at an insane rate um they seem to go through um more uh like the us scale and seasons and um heights of their national herd flock and a uh, time of a lot of rain more pasture availability and so it is peaking at the moment especially for the sheep flock and also um the national uh, beef herd and so a consequence of that is they are packing, they're shipping, they're processing a lot of animals and that is going uh, into our key markets, especially China, and making it very competitive for us. Um, when the end is in sight, I'm not too sure. I wouldn't put, put money on it. Um, but there has been some little signs that more lambs have been sent off to the processes rather than uh, being used for restocking purposes. Um, on this slide, it basically shows uh, the week we are working to a calendar year along here. Um, and this is just for the mutton kill. And this is how the year has started. 
how much they are killing per week. This is from uh, Meat and Livestock Australia. Last year, which was this 2023 line, that was bananas, and now we're starting even higher. Um, what's also interesting is that the cattle slaughter is also very high, and they're also ex exporting a lot of beef, um, but it's seem to be overshadowed by the um, lack of beef uh, that the US has locally over there, um, which, yeah, which is just crazy, but they're still very competitive with us and the US. I'd also show um, this is the lamb graph, week on week, numbers of slaw per week, um, and this is the cattle kill. And the interesting thing about lamb is that in 2022, that was a record year, then that was broken in 2023, and now it's it's way to be smashed again in 2024. So it's quite a lot being processed. USA, the economy is looking solid. Um, consumers over there seem to be doing all right. Coming into this grilling season, 4th of July, May, summer, when it starts heating up, we think that there, there should be solid demand there. Um, Local supply of beef is incredibly low. Um, the herd is 10% lower compared to 2020. Uh, distributors, supermarkets are struggling to get um, beef uh, locally there at the moment. Um, and there is much more supply coming in from, um, uh, from imports, namely from Australia and also us. Um, interestingly about how these uh, trade dynamics work is that Brazil is usually the top exporter of beef, but into the US, their um, competitiveness is relatively subdued because they only have uh, um, uh, uh, they only have a quota where they can where they have to compete with others. Whereas Australia and New Zealand, we have our own uh, set of a quota, um, and that's about to be filled, or it's basically filled now. Um, elevated prices are expected to be. Um, out to are expected until 2028. Uh, and the USDA, um, their version of MPI basically, um, has explicitly said that um, they're expecting more imports from the Oceania region uh, for the medium term. This also pre uh, presents an, maybe an opportunity for New Zealand exporters, but who knows, there is going to be a shortage of grain fed uh, meat in the world because of um, how much less per head there is over there in the US. So opportunity for New Zealand, maybe to get them onto grass fed beef, who knows. Um, also lamb exports to this market has been um, solid and they still pay a, a lot of money for it. So um, we'll see how that progresses for the rest of the season. Europe, Europe is looking okay, looking mixed to poor. Um, inflation still seems to be quite sticky for um, uh, uh, for consumers over there, um, but it looks like it's coming down. Natural gas, um, well, any high energy costs seems to be a thing of the past nowadays, and they're more worried about sticky inflation and cost of living, much like us over here. Internal political strife seems to be kicking up at the moment, um, especially um, for farmers over there, um, which is very interesting. Um, I think this week the Spanish farmers are now um, protesting. Last week it was the French. The week before that it was Belgium. It's just kicking off over there. Um, and they seem to be going through a little bit of a drought, especially for their, um, their uh, sheep producing um, countries. And so imports are seem to be plugging that hole a little bit. And we've seen that on our um, exports as there has been more volume demand um, going into the European market. Um, alongside the UK being up, um, the, we, there was a really good Christmas trade for um, going into the UK as uh, New Zealand import prices seem to have found their floor and um, supermarkets seem to be demanding again. But again, into the UK, we are competing against the um, Australians a little bit there too. Uh, the UK NZFTA is showing a little bit of traction in beef, but it's from a very low point to a kind of low point again. But there is something there. There is some high quality uh, New Zealand beef moving into this market there. Um, but yeah, that's yeah, it's looking okay. 
And so what they all synthesize is down to is what we think uh, prices are going to be for the next um, until the end of September. I guess the biggest headline thing is that sheep prices are much lower, um, especially for lamb. Lamb's below the five year average, it's down 12% last season, and it was down 12% the season before when we had that record season in 21 22. The other bigger headline thing is that mutton has plummeted down to $63 per head. That's around about two, from memory, I think that's $2.40 uh, per kilo of carcass weight, um, over halved in the past two years. Beef is holding. Beef is still 2% above the five-year average, still going along all right, but this, we still expect a decrease uh, led by less demand out of China. Um, and just to put this in perspective of how, low, um, how much sheep prices have decreased, back in 2016, 2017, if we're looking at the mutton prices over time, this is when it was started to increase and everybody started to think about what China will be as a key market, especially for mutton way back then. That was, you know, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, and now we're back down under that point. Remember that, that it's something that I've been trying to think about, but it's like how much time has, you know, how, ma how many new people have um, had their disposable incomes increase since that time in China? I mean, there could be, um, uh, ASF is a thing of a part, uh, African swine fe fever that was ex um, affecting the pork supply over there is a thing of the past. And maybe there's just a bit of fam familiarity with pork. So people have gone back to pork versus mutton. Um, who knows? Um, but it's just quite interesting how much lower the um, you know demand for sheep has been all driven by China and Australian competitiveness. So, yeah. Uh, I'll hand over to Angie now to talk about profitability. Great, thanks, Matt. <clears throat> um, so I guess that the the sort of high level, what we're looking at is the forecast for this current season um, out to the 30th of June. And in October, we were forecasting those farm gate prices for this season to be comparable to last season, to 22-23. But as Matt's um, discussed, you know, we've re revised those prices downward, uh, which is making a big difference in our profitability forecast. So we've got lower gross farm revenue, particularly the sheep revenue there. So the, the lamb crop is, is helpful, um, but it doesn't offset those low farm gate prices. And uh, so we do have some more prime or store lambs, depending on the farm class, um, to sell. But overall, the sheep revenue is down. Now the cattle revenue is also down, and that is partly there's a little there's a softening of the farm gate cattle prices, um, but we've also got slightly fewer numbers. So if our purchasing is steady, we're slightly down on the numbers to sell. So overall, that brings down the gross farm revenue by about ten percent. And farm expenditure, we're expecting it to to just increase slightly. But what's really happening there is um, interest expenditure. It's forecast at 89000 on average. And this is about another $18,000 on last season just to service, to service debt that farmers need. So really the volume, uh, farmers have been cutting expenditure all season. And the farm inputs, the volumes of um, inputs going into the farm are down significantly. So, um, for example, I think the fertilizer might be down around six percent um, per per hectare, and it had dropped the previous season as well because the prices were so high. So overall, the farm profitability is forecast to to basically um, halve from last season uh, to an average of sixty two six hundred, and this sort of little relief between now and and June. I'm sorry, next slide, please, Matt. And I'll just put some cattle in here because, um, you know, cattle are going to be key this season on the revenue side of things. Uh, so farms that have a greater dependence on sheep revenue are particularly impacted and also those with higher debt levels as well. So they're going to be quite vulnerable to this downturn at the moment with the high interest costs. We'll go on to the next one, thanks, Matt. And then have a look here. 
if you joined us for the new season outlook, I used this slide as well, just to look across it at the last four seasons. So we've revised both the 22-23 figures as our economic service managers have more data coming in while they're visiting farms throughout the season. We've revised the 22-23. We've had a slight upward revision in the gross farm revenue. Wasn't as dire as we had initially thought. Um, and we've also tweaked that farm expenditure. But you can see the sort of drop there. Matt, can you flick on? There's some uh, animation there. So in 2021-22 was a really, it was an exceptional season for farm gate prices. And so the green arrow there, 63% increase, that's from 2020-21 to 21-22. Um, then we've come back. Last season, we came back around 29%. And then what we're forecasting for this season is farm profit before tax to decrease again by the 54%. And farm profit before tax, that does include interest. Uh, it includes rent. And it also includes depreciation, which is a non-cash item as well. But even if we added that depreciation back in, we say it's um, around 24000 on average. We put that back in. There's still, you know, tax and, and farm um, drawings, farm family living, principal repayments, capital expenditure, all of those sorts of things that are really tight or deferred, just not happening this season. Thanks, Matt. Well, to we take a closer look at the sort of top five cash farm expenses, and I wanted to sort of draw your eye in there on the first line, that interest there. So we're forecasting an average. Uh, this season of 89,000. And you can see, I mean, that's, yeah, um, around about 18, 19,000 more than last season in cash that farmers need to have um, to service debt. And it takes interest as a percentage of your total farm expenditure up to 16% in that far right hand column. If we go back, like just back to 2020, 21, um, that interest was about 10% of the farm expenditure. And usually we spend more on, on fruit, lime and seeds. So that's come back. Um, and I think I already said the fertiliser, the fertiliser volumes have dropped back across both seasons now. So it's dropped back another sort of 6% there. And we'll go to the next one. Thanks. So what does it look like over a longer time series? In the mid-season update, we... Um, we do adjust that farm profit before tax, adjust it for inflation, and say, what does it look like in real terms? Um, so for this season, the farm profit before tax in real terms adjusted is 38,000, almost 39,000. Yes, thanks, Matt. There it is, way down there. And I mean, you, you can look across there and see that that's similar to the late 80s and early 90s. You know, the late 80s when we were following that deregulation, um, really tough times for farmers, some real real challenges there. So in real terms, this is a very low profit season. Um, another observation, I guess, from this graph here, looking at the, the averages over time and the volatility, I think in the 80s and 90s, it would have felt like a bit of a roller coaster um, with the, you know, being exposed to market prices and, and changes there. Would have felt like a roller coaster for farmers, but if we look at the last um, 20 years, we're looking at from this century, basically those highs and lows there on average, and there's a lot of distribution around that, but the volatility has really increased. It's like we're on a, a super, a souped up roller coaster now, I suppose. If we flick to the next one, please, Matt, because um, one of the, um, another KPI that we often look at is yes we're on it there is the um EBIT RM so earnings before interest tax rent and managerial wages so that lets us look at farms without that um, the burden of debt so as a debt free sort of freehold basis owner operators and that's a, a standardized measure for benchmarking so in the inflation adjusted EBIT RM here shows if you just flick on that animation please we're actually, so this is inflation adjusted again. It's the EBIT RM per hectare on the farm and we're actually lower than in 1980 
um, but you can sort of see again how comparable that is this current season to some pretty tough times that farmers have been through, have, have weathered before. So we'll just take a look at what's the impact across the regions. Back to, this is farm profit before tax in the profit column that you've got there, and then EBITRM as a comparison. So EBITRM is, you know, it does look a lot higher, but as we discussed, the things to come out of there are interest, so the interest, the tax, the rent, and uh, drawings, capital expenditure, principal, and so on. If we look regionally, the East Coast is forecast to have the toughest season. It's a combination of factors there. Yes, they're affected like everyone else by these low farm gate prices, but they also have um, fewer stock in some cases. They might be trying to rebuild some numbers didn't have the cattle in place because it was so wet last year, um, really hard hard to get cattle on. Also thinking that we had um, an El Nino weather pattern and that we could be going into a drought. Anyway, it's been really tough on the coast, so the profitability is very, very low there. Uh, another area that's quite low, Otago Southland, and that's impacted by our high country farms too that are there, probably also the hill country farms that can be more dependent on sheep revenue so with the sheep revenue coming back back hard that is that is making a big impact on those farms as well um one more thing on the stock units that are shown here for marlborough canterbury and otago southland sorry the um hectares are inflated a bit by those high country farms as well can we, why they look a little bit higher so that's kind of the regional roundup and then on to um the mid-season update Matt mentioned will be coming out next week. So we should be able to hit the e-diaries by next Friday, the 15th of March. And for e-diaries, if you'd like, there's the report to link to. And then we have some farmer-facing tools as well. So just popping in here, these will be updated with the latest season by the end of the week. Uh, we have the benchmarking tool here. This is in the Knowledge Hub on our website. So farmers can compare their operation with some average figures. And it's not just financial, there's physical. You can sort of see hopefully a glimpse there of lambing percentage and, and hoggett lambs as well. So there's production indicators, physical stuff there, and also financial indicators as well. There are some price, there are prices involved in that tool as well. So you can see um, uh, wool and um, lamb prices and so on as well. So that's the benchmarking tool that's quite interactive. On the last one, these spreadsheets that are in the industry data section online, and I've got the, the pathway there to the sheep and beef farm survey data, these give you a longer time period. So this should have about a decade. I think we've got a decade, and it's by farm class and by region. So you can pick into those. And again, you've got the production, the price, and the financials that you can take a look at there. Um, it's just more ex extensive and you can really drill in to some of those things. So you can drill into detailed expenditure if you're having a conversation um, with farmers or you know that you want a bit more, more data, a bit more details on things. So these are a couple of tools that we could add into the e-diaries as well um, to share with farmers. And now that's it. So does anyone have any questions? I was thinking that Aaron, um, Aaron just in the chat, early oh. 1980s, Ebert Irene was at um, skewed upwards by the subsidies and that. Mm. Maybe Andrew could answer that, but I'd assume so because they'll come under your earnings, wouldn't it? Yeah, and then from 1984, you see that drop. I don't know if we want to go back to that EBIT RM graph map. We have a little, this one here. Mm. Yeah, so it's from the mid, you can sort of see it there in 1984, um, just dropping, just falling there and through into the 90s as well and, and, and rocking around there. Andrew, you have, yes, we had some subsidies. Yeah. Once. You guys, yeah, you've nailed it. <laughs> so next question. Quick. 
Go ahead, Rob. Cheers, Nat. Um, I know this is crystal ball gazing, but um, how long do you think the Australian supply, elevated sort of supply, might last for, both for lamb and beef? Mm -hmm. And I guess, are there any green shoots or or things to look out for in China? Do you know what I mean? Like, because it feels like, yeah, like you said, those are the two big, big yeah. dynamics at the moment, right? Yeah. Um, I'll answer the China question first. Every day I wake up and I read new sites, China related, it just always tends to be more bad news and there hasn't seemed to be any green shoots so, so far so yeah and this has been going on for a better part of a year um as i said there it, it is extremely shady they're extremely uh, opaque about the data that they want to release for example their property prices have been um sorry their property market has been in a big downturn for the past four years almost they don't release the volume of houses sold, they only release the prices. So you just you have no idea what's going on. Um, and there, there are little to no shoots that I'm seeing any positives that I'm seeing uh, coming out. Because we, we also got to remember much of what China is demanding is the world is demanding less of it, namely the EVs. Um, that's a big one, the EVs and just the foreign investment, all the big companies seem to be leaving. In terms of Australia, on the sheep side, um, as I said, the um, there have been MLA have put on their website, Meat Livestock Australia, that the the ratios at sale yards of lambs that would go to processes versus uh, for restocking purposes, so back on farm, um, the ratio of them going to the works has been larger. So they have commented saying that there should be less lambs available later on in this year. I don't want to hold my breath, though, because, as I've said, there is an insane amount of animals being um, killed. That that could be an argument for there's more being killed now, so there could be less later on, but I wouldn't hold my breath. There has been a lot of um, animals being killed, and it's always surprised me. Um, in terms of cattle, um, they said that uh, MLA said that it's expected to peak the size of it in 2025. But you remember there, then after that you would have to get through all the capital stock if if the feed situation changes. Um, so that could be more, um, you know, competitiveness for at least the medium term um, for Australia. So. Dion has a question. How are we comparing with dairy? Are they seeing levels compared compared to dairy in the 80s? Good question. I've seen the only part that I can comment on is that I've seen the GDT, the the um, uh, the auction price for various milk products um, start to see a bit of lift the past couple of months. Um, I've asked my um, respective dairy guys about it and they just say China. And I'm like, what do you mean about China? And they said they're seeing some demand. So that could to row to answer your question again, that could be a bellwether for meat in the future because that did happen a couple of years ago, but I wouldn't um, uh, bet money on it. Definitely not. Um, but uh, Angie, would you be able to comment yeah. on um, what dairy farmers are up to lately? Yeah, I did say uh, Fonterra had lifted. So with the, yeah, they might, they might be seeing some positive signs there coming through with the GDT and other sales that they've got that aren't being made public because Fonterra did lift their payout. Dairy and Z have an econ tracker tool, and they were looking at a. Um, I'm just scanning it now at a deficit for farmers for 22-23, and they actually, in terms of cash, they are more positive for this season. I'm not. They they updated this in December. So I don't know if we put that into real terms, if we looked at it in inflation adjusted terms and went back to the 80s. I, I think if things are looking um, reasonably positive for dairy now, it is it's probably better than the 80s. So they're not in the same, not in the same boat as us, although their expenses 
have really uh, cranked up over time. Mm. Yeah, we could we could ask them how bad is it? How bad are things compared to the eighties? How are you guys doing? Quick question for me: um, If we don't see a China recovery, uh, and if we don't see interest rates drop in the next little while, what sort of comes next? The on the expenditure slide, there wasn't a lot of movement other than in fertilizer came down a little bit. Would you expect to see fertilizer continue to drop again, or uh, what else could happen? Crystal ball gazing. So you think about the next season? Oh, sorry. Mm, the next season is not that far away, really, is it? And so, mm. in the next few months, if we don't have any recovery mm. and interest rates don't ease up, um, people start making their investment decisions for the next season. Would you expect to see fertilizer drop away further, or does that then start to dig into R and M or wages? Or well, yeah. I mean, we have. There's already been a reduction in the wages in the R and M because R and M is one of the first, you know, sort of levers that you pull. We're trying to save money there. I think the fertilizer could could come back, could come back further, and then what production impacts, you know, that's going to have some impacts on production. And even this season, if it just keeps pulling back. Um, so it is difficult when you get a downturn like this, like the jobs just don't get done, and then the farms can end up looking, you know, a bit shabby, and then you've got quite a bit of deferred. Deferred maintenance to do um, to catch up on things. I had seen. I mean, there'll be, there'll be farmers selling some other assets potentially if they're chopping off a bit of land or they have some other assets to sell, bringing in more off-farm income. Because yeah, I, I think there's been a lot of cost cutting already over two seasons. That'll probably continue, um, but you know, how how far can you cut it down? And and potentially, I mean, some people might move, look at the revenue side of things as well, if they've got those poor returns from sheep. Some farm classes can be quite um, a bit, bit more adaptable, I suppose, like some of the finishing ones might be trying to move more into cattle away from sheep. But, you know, some of those decisions take some years to, to sort of flow through as well. Uh, and interest rates, NZIR just put out their quarterly consensus sort of forecasts and they had mortgage rates maybe coming down by September so thinking for next season not this season um yeah it was mortgage rates by around September this year and these things change every quarter and it wasn't until March next year with those overdraft rates because I, I don't think I mentioned that yeah I mean we've got increased overdrafts we're dependent on more overdraft lending this season which again adds to that interest burden farmers have oh Sharon's made a comment there the off farm work it's already happening yep we're already selling things off and cutting some trees early as well yeah thanks Sharon it might be us yeah no more questions idea. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. Mm. Thanks great. for listening, everyone.